The challenges that face businesses in the year ahead and in the years beyond that are not actually that different from the challenges that have faced businesses in the last decade. The pace of change, the need for tech savviness, the necessity for leaders to humanize leadership in a world where more of our communication is becoming digital, the necessity to address the challenge of equality and diversity in hybrid working environments where we're not together, we're not working the same hours, and we may not have the same cultural references from which to assess what is the belief system we want to work with and how do we make sure that everyone feels a part of it. These are all the kinds of challenges that the Harvard Business School identified after research they did with 1,300 people in learning and development and other functional areas of businesses where people were responsible for leadership development in global organizations. So in this video, I'm going to share with you the five skills that as a behavior change specialist, I believe will be the five skills that you need in order to make the difference to you, your teams, and your organization's success. Now, the skills that get mentioned in the leadership literature are things like adaptability, emotional intelligence, communication, the ability to motivate people. But from my standpoint as a behavior change specialist, it's my job to get people to change behavior, to have them go from doing one thing to doing a different thing. And for me, headings like that are the holes that we fall into. For me, saying that we're done once we've identified that we need emotional intelligence or agility or flexibility are not enough. They're so vague as to say nothing at all. And so the skills I'm gonna share with you are skills that lead to those headings, skills that would give you emotional intelligence, help you, create environments where people are more likely to feel motivated and to experience that level of motivation. And skills that will help you communicate more effectively, be more influential, and get the organization moving in the direction of your goals more often. So the very first skill to start with, for me, the most important one that underpins everything, if you do nothing else but develop this one skill, it could change everything. And that is the skill of asking powerful questions. So many of us go straight into solution mode. We go into telling people what to do. We go into action and we don't stop to make sure we're solving the right problem. We don't stop to recognize what's actually going on here. What is happening? Why is this affecting me the way it's affecting me? How did I get here? How did this become normal for my team? Those are the types of questions that are powerful. Questions that expose information that previously was not exposed or previously you had a particular perspective and this question changes your perspective or opens you up, uncovers a bias, shines light into a blind spot, gives you the ability to understand somebody else and therefore become more influential in the communication. That's what a powerful question does. Now, since this isn't a how-to video, I'm not gonna go into any further detail on how to develop that skill, but effectively, if you were to find yourself in situations where you're about to say something, tell someone your thought, tell them what to do, or you're about to make a judgment of somebody because maybe you feel that they're making an excuse about something, if you can catch it in that moment and just think, what could I ask that will help me gather more information? If you can do just that one thing that will help you on the road to asking powerful questions. So that's skill number one. Skill number two is learning how to learn. This is a skill I practice in my own business. It is one that I have to practice repeatedly. I do most functions in my own business. And that means that the faster I can gather information, the better I can remember information, and the faster I can get through emails, books, large chunks of text, research papers, the faster I am at acting on the ideas I have, making changes, producing products, creating training courses, and getting information to the teams that I'm working with at whatever time on whatever project. So for me, the person I follow in my efforts to develop this skill is a man called Jim Quick. I've put details in the description box below if learning how to learn is something that you feel would benefit you. And this is all about 
learning how to remember things better, learning how to read faster, and even just his free course, which took one hour, increased my reading speed by 30% in an hour. And if you think about, if you could read a book a week, if you could get it down to a book every two days, if you could read 20 page reports in five to 10 minutes, how would that change what you can accomplish in a day? Having that skill when the world is changing so quickly and technology is advancing so fast can put you ahead of the curve. So for that skill, I would say check out Jim Quick and see what you can learn from just the free content alone. And then if that takes your fancy, of course, there's loads more that you can invest in and start gathering skills for speed reading, memory enhancement, and so on. Skill number three is the ability to name things. In my work with groups of leaders, I've noticed a trend, a pattern that exists in every group. And it comes from two things or possibly one thing, but looked at from two different ways. And that is failure to identify the problem they're actually trying to solve and jumping straight into solution mode. So what happens is you get groups of the brightest minds coming together in meetings and it will be a case of, okay, this is what's going on in the business. What do we do? And people will be like, okay, well, we could do this. We could do that. We could do X, Y, Z. And the most salient idea that captures the rest of the room is the one that gets picked and people move. But at no point has anyone paused to make sure that they're solving the right problem. So what ends up happening is often groups of people solve the wrong problem. So let's take an example. We have a group of leaders and they want a team of 10 people to effectively run a relatively creative process of a client proposal they want each of the 10 people to run that process as efficiently as possible. So those 10 people are working with 10 different clients and the goal of the organization is to make that proposal process as efficient as it possibly can be. So the board of directors sit down and they go, okay, how do we make this happen? They say, right, let's create templates. Let's create a process document. Let's tell people to do step one, step two, step three. And then they find that people aren't sticking to the process. So then they go, let's do these five things that will kind of force people into this process that's going to speed things up and unify everything. But what they've missed entirely is what failed in the previous set of measures? What barriers exist to people unifying the process? So you can see that this particular skill sits very nicely with the ability to ask powerful questions. But the thing here is when you can really name what the problem is or name the exact behavior that needs to happen in order to achieve the outcome you want, you are in a much better position to shape the environment to shape the processes, to shape your communication in such a way that you drive behavior in the direction that you want it to go. How you do that, again, is beyond the scope of this video, but effectively, in a summary, the thing to do is to notice when you go into solution mode, when you're starting to look at, well, what could we do? And go, if every single person in this room was to name the problem, write it down on a piece of paper, and then we look at all those papers, would they all say the same thing? And if the answer is no, I mean, you could try it as a thought exercise, actually do it and get a sense of where the miscommunication lies. Get to the point where all of you agree on what the problem is and what it is you're trying to solve and then move forward from there. The fourth skill is the ability to switch into play mode. Now, this is one that transports from parenting into the workplace really well. And it came from a tool that we use in adoptive parenting or therapeutic parenting called PACE, which stands for playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And these are about the states that we as parents go into in order to engage with our children slightly differently. But in the workplace, it can be enormously useful as well when people get stuck when the seriousness of the potential failure or loss or mistake or whatever is 
so heavy to bear that people get stuck in their thinking, stuck in their habits, and potentially too fearful to try things or too fearful to open up. So trust in relationships can be affected, productivity can be affected, motivation can be affected, and communication can be affected. And so the ability to enter play mode is about the temporary easing of the seriousness of the consequences, even if just for the purposes of a thought exercise, a sort of what if. Again, it's a type of powerful questioning. Play mode in the workplace is not about joking around and having a laugh, although those things can be helpful, but it's more about releasing yourself from the stuckness of reality and thinking about how you might engage in whatever the problem-solving situation is or the task is in such a way that it becomes easier at a psychological level. So a good example of this is a group I worked with where we started off with the leaders and one of the things that they were looking at was a new cultural message, kind of really framing the mission, the organization beliefs and shaping it into such a kind of almost a tool set that they wanted people to have to say, you know, this is what our organization stands for. This is how we communicate with each other. This is what we stand for in the marketplace and with our clients. And before our working together, they had sat down and they'd made PowerPoint presentations and they had their mantras and they had their mission statements and they had it all typed up and they were going to deliver it as a presentation and then give everybody the presentation across the organization. And I thought, this is the exact moment for play mode. So what I encouraged them to do, we got the entire organization, it's a small organization, so it was less than 50 people. We got all of them together in groups with flip charts and pens and magazines and all sorts of stuff. And we said to them, here are the broad headings. This is the kind of big vision. What do you see happening? How would this unfold as a company culture? What would be some of the things we would stand for? How would we communicate these things? We had all these different questions and all these different activities that we worked with. And then, because this was a creative agency, people responded very creatively to it. And I knew that would be the case. So this particular exercise was one where they were able to use play mode to engage people, to have them be part of the outcome, to be ha- have them be part of what would later be presented to the whole organization and every single person in the room could see a little glimmer of something they had contributed to. So that's a good example of how play might work. So it's not necessarily about having a big old laugh, although there was a lot of laughter when we did that exercise. It's more about inviting people to play with ideas, with concepts, with tasks, with possibilities and see what they produce. Because very often the people who are gonna do the work are the people who can come up with the solutions in a much better way than the people who are watching the work happen or directing the work in some way. So that's skill number four. And the final skill, skill number five, is the skill of pattern detection and pattern disruption. Where you have people who are stuck, where you have outcomes in the business that you don't want, you're not happy with, then, the ability to recognize, well, what is contributing to that? Again, you see the link with powerful questions. How is this our version of normal? How did this come to be the way we do things? That will help you uncover the pattern. And then you can start figuring out, well, how do we disrupt the pattern? What would we need to change in the way we do things that would naturally cause that pattern to break in some way. Now, most leaders within most organizations, certainly that I've seen over my years of doing this work, have been kind of inclined to put processes in place. So they notice something and then they go, okay, well, that's not working. So let's tell people we're going to do it this way. As I already mentioned in skill four, involving people through play mode can be helpful in finding a new way to do things. But outside of that, If you can set up your environment in such a way that the new desired behavior becomes easier to do than the old 
undesired behavior, that can be better. So for example, if you have, let's say in your organization, it's normal for people to come to meetings late and it's normal for them to multitask and be on their phones the majority of the time. But actually, that means that when people leave the meeting, the quality of the conversation hasn't been particularly great. You haven't identified the problems correctly. You've jumped straight into solution mode and no one's noticed. And after the meeting, there's often miscommunications or people go off in different directions, having theoretically agreed on something, but then the way they work just doesn't demonstrate that agreement. Then having people be present in the meeting may be more helpful. So... Then you start to look at, well, what is the pattern? How did we create a normal where this is how we do things, where people arrive late and then they're on their phones? Once you identify how that became normal, what are the habits that lead to that? Then you can start thinking, okay, well, how do we change the habits? What kinds of things could we do? So maybe you just have a basket at the entrance to the meeting room and everyone's phones go in those, assuming you're all in the same place. If it's a virtual meeting, that's harder to do. Then maybe you need to think about how you set up virtual meetings in such a way that engagement changes. So then you could think about perhaps having different people in the meeting take responsibility for writing on a virtual whiteboard so that everyone can contribute. And the fact that their hands have to be on the keys in order to be able to do that can stop them multitasking and doing multiple other things simultaneously. So little things that you can do that mean that the way people engage with you or with the task or with the project naturally predisposes them to make new habits and new patterns, you can then lead to a change in behavior that ultimately drives the organization in the direction that you want it to go. That is really the kind of key part of my work is pattern detection and then helping leaders to identify where the patterns need to be disrupted. And that is partly why I've had to develop all the previous skills that I've mentioned to you already. I hope this video has helped you think about the skills that you might need to develop. If you have enjoyed the video and found it useful, please like, do subscribe. I've got plenty more of these videos coming out. And if you have questions, pop them in the comments and you can also get in touch with me. My details are in the description box below. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions and help you out if your organization needs help shaping leadership so that the behaviors within your organization really lead you towards the success you're driving for in 2024.